Uh, welcome to the talk about digging into Valky. If you are not interested in that, uh, well, too bad, you're already here. So, um, so I want to introduce somebody. Introduce yourself, I guess. Yeah, hello, my name is Madeline. I'm an engineer at AWS and the creator of Valky. And my name is Kyle. Uh, I'm a developer advocate from the Valky project. Um, so we're going to be swapping off, uh, doing some things. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a history lesson, kind of get you into this, and then Madeline will talk about what's next for Valky. Um, so you've heard who we are. Let's find out who you are. Um, so I want to do a little bit of an audience poll. Raise your hand and keep it up, because we're going to go through a series of these. If you uh, write or run software on a server, whatever that means in the year of our Lord, 2024. Okay. Uh, now, if you've ever used something to cache or like an in-memory database, a few people put their hands down. Okay. You've used Redis. Okay. Most people have used that. Uh, you know what Valky is? Okay. More people, that's interesting. More people know that. Uh, you've used Valky. Okay. A few people have. Uh, you're on the technical steering committee for Valky. We actually have some people in the room. Thank you. We'll, 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 I'm sure I have lots of questions for you later on. Um, so this session is going to go into a little bit of detail about like what Valky is, you know, what do you use it for, just kind of get people who aren't familiar with it uh, up to speed, and then we'll get into kind of like you know how this happened, uh, what got us here, and then we'll go forward from there. So uh, one of the things that people talk about is uh, you know wh why would you store things in memory? And this is a question that people initially think, okay, well, it's about caching, right? So you have something slow, you want to go faster, so you put a subset of your data into the memory of the system, and then you can use that to read out faster. And that's a, a very decent use case for storing things in memory. Um, but there's many others that kind of do come into this. One of the things is that you can actually write faster in memory. Um, so, you know, if you actually start using something like uh, a regular database and you start benchmarking it versus in memory, you'll see that like a regular database often will do very well in the read capacity because it already has caching built into it. Caching is incredibly useful, but writing is a whole other thing. That's something that's much harder to solve. So uh, if you store things in memory, you can actually kind of read and write at the same speed. The other thing that you can do is you can seek instantly. Um, and thankfully we are moving out of the era of the spinning disk. That still does have a place in our modern systems. But even when you get down to it, some of the drivers and how the firmware is implemented actually kind of like start to emulate things in a spinning disk, weirdly. Um, so you can kind of get around that by having something that's user addressable, um, which RAM is. So it makes it have very low latency. And then I think the most important thing, and this kind of underlies all the rest of the three here, is that you have really good control over what you're doing when you're using RAM. Um, you're not worrying about blocks or any other kind of arbitrary um, levels of abstraction. You can go, I want to use this byte. Please give me this byte, and I will use it for whatever I want to use it for. Um, and you give, like, really minute control. So that's the reason why, like, in-memory makes sense. But let's talk a little bit about history. Now, um, when we start talking about this, we kind of have to start talking about Redis first. I've already mentioned Redis once. It provides valuable context for... Uh, Valky. So this kind of all begins back, uh, you know, the late 2000s, uh, 2008, 2009. There's a guy named Salvatore Sanfilippo. He was on Sicily, the island in the Mediterranean. Um, and he had a project where he was working and he realized that spinning disks were going to be so hard to scale out, right? Functionally, for the workload that he wanted to do, which was an analytical workload, he had to use an inordinate number of spinning disks because the writes weren't fast enough, the reads weren't fast enough, and his aha moment was, he said, well, if I just store it in memory. And that's what became the open source Redis project. At the time, he wasn't working for a company that you may be familiar with, Redis Labs, he's working for another company, um, and they were able to let him make this open source project. And honestly, when it came out, Redis didn't set the world on fire. It was well received and people had known Salvatore, he'd worked on other open source projects, um, but he, you know, it didn't really take off. But what really made it kind of take off is the Ruby community. Ruby is a very expressive language. Um, you can write really great software with it really quickly. At that time period, it wasn't very performant though. And so they realized that they could take 
a instance of Redis and run it alongside a Ruby instance, the interpreter for the language, the runtime for the language, and get really good performance out of it. And so Redis started growing very rapidly out of the Ruby community. And of course, it wasn't tied in any way to Ruby, but it just happened to be the people who picked it up in, in mass early on. Um, and people said, this is a really good idea. Writing stuff to memory is really good. What if we could do it at a much larger scale? And that's when clustering came out. That was around 2014. My personal involvement with uh, Redis at the time came about this time. I remember when clustering came out and I said, I would never need to cluster my Redis instances. Um, and I was wrong, um, as most people are. They, they underestimate the amount of the store in memory. So um, there we have this where the modern Redis kind of comes out and we start seeing the industry-wide adoption of the open source project. Now, um, what's important about this when you start realizing how it's different from other ones, uh, key value stores have existed for a long time, and they generally worked on this idea of a key being stored at a value, and the value was relatively um, dumb, right? It was a series of bytes that you read out, and you used those bytes however you needed to use those bytes. But the real thing that you know, caught in the Ruby community and then caught me when I started getting involved with it was the idea that you had Structures, keys pointed to values that were stored in structures rather than just stored in a series of bytes. Um, and that meant that you had really good control over things that you didn't have before when you just had a series of bytes. So from there, you really started seeing things grow. Um, I wrote a book about Redis myself. Um, I've done lots with Redis because of the structure that's there. And that's what makes it a really kind of special application. Um, so that worked pretty well, um, but we have to start realizing Things have happened. We're not talking about Redis today. We're talking about Valky. Um, so what ended up happening, I actually started working for uh, Redis Labs in 2000, I don't think 15 or 14, something along those lines. I was first a contractor, then I did developer advocacy there. Um, and I worked there for a while. And Salvatore actually got hired there as well, right after the clustering, around the time clustering started happening. Um, so he was working for this company called Redis Labs. Um, and then in 2020, um, for reasons that are not entirely uh, things that I always became aware of, Salvatore decided to uh, no longer work at Redis Labs. And he left the project in the hands of uh, a maintainer group. What was the name of that, Madeline? Core team. Core team. Core team. And it was five people, two engineers from Redis Labs, a community manager from, uh, from Redis Labs, Madeline, and then a person named Zhao Zhao, right? That was the five team. So it's Madeline's from AWS, the two engineers from Redis, and then Zhao Zhao's from Alibaba. Um, and it was actually kind of lauded in the, the press. Like, this is great. Redis now has kind of this community governance. It's no longer in the control of just one person. It was multiple organizations coming together. Of course, we wouldn't be here if that was the end of the story. Um, a few weeks ago, March 20th, 2024, uh, there was a blog post that was posted. Uh, by uh, Redis, they dropped the lab from their name and said, in effect, Redis is no longer open source. It, this is not hyperbolic. This is actually what's in the, um, the blog post. They say this pretty directly. They changed the license of the open source project to RSAL v2 and SSPL um, to source available licenses, non open source licenses. Obviously, and I think at the same time, they, they, did they formally, Madeline, say the core team is done at that time, or did they just? So they silently deleted the governance page. Um, so that was probably felt pretty great to the people on that uh, core team. Um, and at that point, people said, well, we still need to do what Redis is doing. We still need an open source project. And that's where we get to Valky. Uh, first, it was called Placeholder KV, which is a name that is inspired. And I kind of wish we had kept it. Um, it. It does say things, but I think that Valky is a better name for of the long term. Um, and Valky is a project that's about continuity, um, at least initially. So let's talk about what happened with the continuity. The first and probably most important thing for most people is it continues the BSD3 clause. Uh, that was the license that Redis has had since the beginning, and it enabled people to continue doing that. We'll get more into this a little bit later. Um, it continued how Redis was built. I'm not saying that single-threaded C is the best way to write an application but it is the way Redis is written. And if you want to continue and have continuity in how you've laid things out, you kind of need to have the same type of application. And it has maintainer carryover. 
And so the people, if we go back to that core group, there was three organizations that were involved, two of which have gone to Valky. So let's break this down. Now, the one thing I do want to say is, in this kind of chaos that emerged after Redis changed the license, there's lots of people who are talking about other versions of Redis um, that had come out derived from that um, and under different names and different licenses and so on. So let's, let's take a look at those. So at the top, we have Redis. Um, it is, as we discussed, no longer open source. Um, it doesn't have the same license, so that continuity is not there. It uses RSAL v2 SSPL, um, which is a mouthful. Uh, of course, it has its single-threaded C. It's the same as it was from a technical standpoint a few weeks ago. Um, and of the three companies involved in the core team, Redis remains, so one of those three companies. A couple days before the announcement, Microsoft produced a project that is Redis compatible called Garnet. Uh, Garnet is an open source project. It uses the MIT license. Now, I, I, to be fair, um, you know, BSD3 clause and MIT license are similar in many, many ways. It is a little red no sign because it's just different, but most organizations would probably look at those in very similar lights. Um, but the thing to know is it's not single-threaded C. It's written actually in C Sharp, so it's a very different type of application. Um, and it's re-implementation by a different group of people, so the maintainers didn't move there. Now, another one that came out, and, and, and at the same time that Valky did, was Redict. Uh, Redict is open source, but it uses a different type of open source license. It uses a copyleft license, LGPL3. Um, and organizations treat that differently in a variety of contexts. Um, that's up to your organization. I'm probably not the best person to describe the, the minutia of why you want to treat that differently but it isn't a permissive license as BSD3 clause is. Um, of course, it derives from the same base that Valky derives from, um, so it is single-threaded C, and there's no maintainer carryover. A key DB is actually a pre-existing uh, version that derived from Redis. I think it came out of Redis 6, do you remember? Yeah, it was 6.2. 6.2. Um, it is uh, open source, it uses the same BSD3 clause license, but its big differentiator is it's multi-threaded C. Um, that's what they wanted to change about it. Um, and one thing I wanna say is, uh, all the people who are involved here who created these projects are probably very smart. If you create a project like this, you probably uh, have the engineering chops to do this. So I'm not saying any of these are better or worse or they're bad for not being this person or whatever, um, but it is different. And I think that's important to know. Another one that people brought up that has existed for a little while is Dragonfly DB. It is also not open source. It's BSL, Business Source License. Um, it doesn't, it's not single-threaded C. I believe it is C++ if my memory serves me. And there is no maintainer carryover. And the last line is Valky. It's open source, has the same exact license, has the same exact operating model as it's a single-threaded C application. And two of the three companies that were involved with the Redis project plus more are now involved in the Valky project. And the other thing that's important to know is that Valky is a Linux Foundation project. So this means that it's not one company that controls it. I think that's really important. People probably feel pretty burned by what happened with Valky. Um, so with this, it's now something that is um, in the Linux Foundation and has multi-organizational um, governance and control. So that's the history. Let's move into a little bit of the status of where we are right now. Um, so. Uh, we released this morning, um, and I have confirmed by building it on my laptop on the show floor downstairs that Valky 7.2.5 GA is out. It builds. We now have a Docker container. Um, we are getting it into um, some of the package managers um, and binaries are out there, but I have not personally updated the website, so they are not on the website yet. We'll get that later on today. Um, it's based on the 7.2 line of Redis which means that it has the same um, basic interface that you would use from it. Um, it has near zero changes from the base. It uses the same API. It uses the same return values. It has the same config format. It has the same type of versioning, which is important for a lot of reasons, and it uses the same data files. So what does that mean? That means if you are currently running Redis 7.2.4, you can do really interesting tricks like turn off the 7.2.4 server, make sure you have persistence on, turn on Valky, point it at the persistence file, so the AOF or the snapshots, and Valky will understand it and say, hey, here's your data. It also means you can do things like heterogeneous clusters. You can take your same config files with you. Uh, it should be pretty easy. We even have things like symbolic links that allow you to even use the same paths um, that you would be using previously. So um, the 
path to production stable Valky. Um, we have released a GA. I think the team is very confident that everything is compatible, but we all know that somebody might be relying on something that we had no idea anybody relied on, so we want to confirm that as people continue to start using it and putting it into production, uh, but we're very confident that there isn't any gremlins there. Um, we want to make sure our build is up to snuff so we can you know, continue to do great things in Valky and do it in a way that doesn't take the team sitting in an office at 7 a.m. in the morning trying to generate binaries. Uh, we want to make our docs better. Um, the Redis docs were a Creative Commons license, and we're now trying to quote-unquote localize them to Valky. Um, it's been challenging because those docs are the result of many generations of people editing them for close to 15 years, and we want to make sure they make sense and that we're not just carrying over things because we could do a search and replace, so we're taking some care there, and there's been lots of work on that. Now, past 7.2x. Now, when we go into the next major version, I think the most important line here, from this point forward, Redis and Valky are two different pieces of software. Like, let that sink in for a minute. This has implications. Um, at a major version, Redis may break compatibility with Valky. They are now a different project. Uh, Valky could break compatibility at a major version with Redis. But I know from the Valky standpoint, no longer work at Redis, I can't tell you, uh, Valky has very little appetite to make changes that are big and breaking. Um, Valky is something that is falling in the tradition of Redis where it's often deeply integrated into um, pieces of software and making these changes be very painful for those who use it. So I think that we want to add to it um, instead of breaking it for everybody else. So how do you get Valky today? Uh, you can build it from source. Like I said, I did that on the show floor. It was very easy. Uh, it takes about four minutes on a woefully underpowered M1 MacBook. Um, and tests take about 10 minutes. I would suggest you run tests, but uh, it's an incredibly easy piece of software to build from source. It's written in C and has very few dependencies. So you just need like CLang and make, and you're good to go. Um, you, we have a Docker container available. Um, it's testing in many uh, Linux distributions. So you can use it in Fedora Rawhide today. Fedora Mainline will come in maybe a week, according to the Fedora team. And it's in Apple as well. So that means that any uh, distro that uses Apple will be able to pick that up as well. Coming soon, we're looking at binary distributions. Uh, we will have that very, very soon. Um, that means that you'll be able to take a Linux distribution and then grab that and use it elsewhere. Um, and I think the other thing to look at too, um, Redis was used in a variety of contexts with lots of different architectures. Uh, right now, we've kind of aimed at what we, we believe to be the kind of um, largest percentage of usage, but we want to cover as many other architectures and OSs as, as, as Redis did, so it's a full replacement. So if you want to contribute, we think we, you should. Um, the repos are valky.io slash valky, uh, valky doc, uh, the valky container website that just has the Docker container, how that's built. Um, and the Valky website, um, these are all open to contribution. There is no contributor license agreement, um, so you don't have to sign away anything when you do this. Um, the contributions are extremely warmly welcomed. One of the things that really warmed my heart when looking at this was that I expected all people who would be working on it would be like people in the technical steering committee doing all the work, but no, it's been contributors from around the world, people that weren't actually like involved in decision making, taking their time to make these changes. In fact, there was one individual uh, from Vietnam that I had never heard of, who at one point was the largest contributor to Valky, um, making changes, to switching it from Redis to Valky and some other kind of like lower level things that he was doing, but it was amazing to see how much he had done. Um, so really, really cool to see that. Um, the only thing that I would say that if you want to contribute to Valky, you think it's something to keep in mind, um, it is a Linux Foundation project and most Linux Foundation projects uses a developer certificate of origin. Um, this is a very simple document. If you go to developercertificate.org, I believe is the um, website. It's like five paragraphs written in plain language. And all it says is, hey, you have the right to contribute what you want to contribute. Um, and you acknowledge this by doing a thing called a sign-off in your uh, commits, not in your PR. We often get that problem. So with that, you have to set up two things in Git. You just say what your username is. That's your real name. Uh, and then your email address 
And then you, when you do your commit, you add dash s to it. And it says signed off by Kyle Davis in the email. And as Madeline and I have been going back and forth on things, she knows that I'm not perfect at it. Um, and I've been doing it for years. It's something easy to miss. But we have a little bot that will tell us we did it wrong, and then we can fix it. So that is my portion of it. At this point, Madeline's going to come up, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the future, and maybe the TSC will dip in where we're responsible. Yes, thank you so much, Kyle. So the rest of this talk will basically be me going over sort of what we're thinking about uh, is next for Valky. The main portion kind of at the end is we want to do a Q&A. As I said, we have two other um, TSC members. I don't know if you guys want to raise your hands again. And we have other people who are very active contributors as well. So we do really want this to be a community-driven project. So. I have only one slide. The slide's going to do a lot of heavy uh, lifting for me. <laughs> and I'm just going to talk for a little bit about kind of what we're looking for uh, to moving forward for next versions of Valky. During the keynote, I announced that we really have two major features we're thinking about for Valky 8, which is we want to make slot migration more reliable. So that's when you're using Valky cluster and scaling out. Right now, when nodes fail, they sometimes end up in inconsistent states. The cluster stops working. Uh, so Ping actually was the one that's working to contribute uh, a patch to make it significantly more reliable. The other change was we already improved the memory density in Valky cluster. Uh, this was a contribution already made in the past by AWS from a, I don't think the engineer's here, but one of my coworkers. That was in the development branch of Redis before the fork, and we're just kind of stabilizing that, finalizing it, and trying to get that out the door. Which I just really want to highlight, like, you know, this rug pull was, like, really bad for the community. Like, we had a bunch of work. It wasn't just Redis doing everything. But the main thing I really want to get out of this is there's a lot of ideas that we're thinking about, and I just sort of kind of want to talk through them. So the first major theme that we're thinking about is performance and memory density. So Valky, we expect mostly people to use as a cache, sort of as Redis was. And the two big properties that people will end up scaling on is throughput and on basically storage capacity. So a lot of the multi-threaded implementations we talked about earlier, we actually think they have some good ideas, and we'd like to kind of implement them. The previous Redis core team that was mentioned was actually very technologically conservative. They really didn't want to break anything. And we think a lot of that was because Redis didn't want to break anything, the, the company. And so they could go build their fancy stuff. So we actually are very interested in trying to make Valky more performant, both for a multi-thread perspective, so it's easier to vertically scale, as well as making each individual core more performant. As Kyle mentioned, like Redis was built way back in 2009. The CPU architecture at the time is actually pretty different than it is now. One of the main differences is CPU often can do a lot more work in parallel. And so we sort of want to tweak Valky so that it's better at doing more operations like pseudo in parallel. So it can better utilize all of the silicon on the CPUs to be able to execute requests faster and more efficiently. So that's sort of from the performance angle. From the memory efficiency angle, we've seen a lot of places within the data structures we can make them more memory dense. So trying to remove pointers, trying to move that stuff. And our goal is with all of that, you basically will be able to get store more stuff in your cache, get better cache hit rates without any changes. It's just a major version upgrade. So our perspective is these are basically just table stakes. All of the other databases we talked about before, they kind of already do all this. That's, that's kind of what they really tried to innovate on. And we're really excited that we'll be able to just do this in the open in a way that everyone will be able to consume. Cool. So the next big theme that we're thinking about is trying to make it easier to manage. And the main feature we kind of have in mind here is this feature we're calling Cluster V2. So does anyone here, I wasn't, I didn't look back for who was using Res, but does anyone here use Res Cluster today? Does anyone here like running Redis Cluster? <laughs> you say there's pros and cons? What are the pros? <laughs> Oh, I see. So the pros are just, you know, it, yeah. So there's a lot of cons. And a lot of that's because it's really like a good first attempt at a clustering algorithm, and it's very difficult to manage. 
And our hope is we'll be able to make this much more reliable as we're trying to move away from a, without getting into too much detail, the way cluster works today is every node has state and they're constantly reconciling the state with everyone else. Really expensive, very error prone. And the new solution is just, you know, one group of nodes knows all the state, everyone talks to them. Much simpler, much more straightforward. It's inspired a lot by the way Kubernetes does uh, state management. And so we think that will make it much more reliable for the future. It will also allow us to do one cool thing, which is we can have cluster-wide metadata. If people aren't familiar with the way Redis clustering works, if you put something like a function or a config, you have to put it on every single node. And it'd be really nice if you could just put it on one node and have it tell the source of truth and then this, everyone in the cluster figure it out. So that's one feature we're really excited about. I know Ping is very excited about it. I'm very excited about it. We tried to build it a long time ago and Redis kind of said no, then maybe, then no. But now that we have a project, we can do whatever we want, so. Cool. So the next big theme that we're really excited about is better integration with other open source projects. So one thing we hear a lot about at AWS is like we want better, in customer, our customers want better integration with other projects like OpenTelemetry, other database products, maybe making it easier to be a transparent cache in front of a backend database. So we're hoping that we can kind of reach out to these projects and as a new open community, we'll be like, hey, can we work with you? And this is one area that I'm specifically interested to getting more contributors to help with. And then the last area, which is maybe the most interesting and most open-ended, is richer extensibility. So Redis was very well known for all of its fancy data structures and they've sort of stopped, if people haven't noticed. Streams last came out, I believe, in 2018. And since then, there's been no new data type inside Redis. And we're not sure if we necessarily want to change that, but we're thinking about maybe using modules as a way to make that uh, more widely available. So modules are the way that Redis allowed extensions, like new data types, to be built outside of the core. So we're hoping we can do that within Valky to make it more native. So some of the data structures we're thinking about building this way are like native JSON type support, maybe vector type support for all the new fancy Gen AI features for vector similarity search. There's also a lot of interest in things like time series or t digests for, I'm sorry, for uh, rate limiting. So that's just like a small set of all the potential features we could build and have them all be sort of like natively distributed within inside the Valky project. So these are the big themes that we're sort of thinking about. Again, none of these are really uh, solidified of what we want to do. And we're really hoping that maybe if one of these sounds interesting to you or you want that, you can come and let us know and we can help priority, prioritize these for our long-term roadmap. Uh, I mentioned during our keynote that we are trying to have a contributor summit to try to get everyone who's interested in Valky together so we can really solidify what we want to do next. So that's everything from the formal part of the deck. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. Here's the ones of our contact information. I got the QR codes on there. Yeah, it's QR codes, so fancy. They should go to the right place. I tested them. Um, so yeah, right. questions. Yeah, questions about the project the or about the future. How do we want to do this? I'll give you, do we have a second microphone maybe? I'll, I'll run. I, now I don't Thank you. Um, that was really nice. Um, I'm glad you guys mentioned like you're gonna keep the compatibility in check and you're gonna monitor the industry adoption of Valky. So I'm just curious, like, what's your plan to do that? Uh, is there an adoption plan in AWS moving forward or, yeah. So I can't say anything about AWS at the moment about Valky support but you are aware that they officially announced their support of the Valky project in a blog post. Um, and I'm sure they'll have more information eventually. Sorry, I can't give you anything more specific right now. I don't know if any of the other folks want to say anything. No, sorry. Same answer, yeah. He says, yeah, similar route as open search. Who knows? The world is very mysterious. I, I would guess something similar, but I, I don't know either, right? Like.
Yeah, stay, stay, stay tuned. tuned. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't know. I mean, I think the, uh, both uh, Madeline and I are, are like firewalled off from a lot of that. I, I know I am. Uh, I'm not. Okay. I know all the details. She knows the details. Uh, but we're also kind of like, we've been doing some stuff. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that there was a new project that was created called Valky that's been kind of... Oh, yeah. I'll say we moved way faster than AWS is moving. Yeah. So that's Lots sure. of docs we're writing. We're reviewing them, going up the chain, going down the chain. Yeah. So much fun. Can we repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is basically, what is the thoughts about architecture support? You mentioned Graviton as well as GPU support. Like Graviton, for sure. I think Graviton is one of the best places to run Valky. It's also been one of the biggest places that's had a lot of innovation in how like the architecture is working. So the big difference that we see, or I see, I guess, about ARM architectures is that they're very much pushing more towards the multi-threading, simpler cores, and which is why we think, which is why I think, uh, Multi-threading is probably important. Uh, for GPUs, it's a little bit less clear what that will be in store for us. There has been a bunch of prototypes of Redis-like architectures that run on GPUs, and they haven't gone a lot of adoption because very few workloads are really throughput bound. Yeah, yeah. that are par they're both parallelizable and throughput bound. Um, there was a really cool talk at one of the res comps in a while ago that did like a billion requests per second, and it looked cool, but it never was all that useful, I guess, uh, because it's rare, it's rare that you'll have such little memory that you're trying to access, and you wouldn't do client-side caching. That's kind of what usually would replace a GPU-type system. Dimitri has a question. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. We, oh, yeah, I forgot. You asked me to do that, and I didn't do it. It's in the speaker notes. Is it? You should say, like... It does. I did not know there was... It's in all speaker. caps. Hello? Okay, hi, my name is Dimitri. I used to run the Seattle Redis meetup, and now I run Seattle Valky meetup. So we have an event next Wednesday, week from tomorrow. Check it out. Just go to meetup, search for Seattle Valky, and we'll be there talking about the future of Valky project. And if it tries to correct to Valley, just yes. it's Valky. No, yeah. Yes, Google does autocorrect it. No, Google no longer autocorrects. It does for me. It's really? Yeah, so I've got the Oro Valley. Is whatever just go to Meetup and search Oro for Seattle Valley. Valky. Yeah, sometimes. Other questions? Uh, I just wanted to know, is the license that you are right now distributing with the BSD, are there any plans down the line? I mean, obviously, you know you know how this goes over a period of time, adoption happens, and then at some point, you know, you end up getting into a dual license. Is that any anything of that sort? Uh, yeah, that so like, yeah, the other question's about, you know, licensing. Current plan is no license change. We'll never change the license the way Redis did. We'll never change it to something like source available license. If the community wants to do a different type of open source, we're open to that conversation, but it, we'll never see what happened with Redis. We'll stay free open source. Given that we're part of the Linux Foundation now, that, that adds a, a pretty significant barrier, especially to the people who are involved with this, to do that. So, um, yeah. yeah everyone's invo everyone involved really wants to keep the project open. They don't want anything like copy left. They just, they really want to keep it open. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm uh, Manfred Moser. I'm with the Trino Software Foundation and the Trino Open Source Project, and we have a Redis plugin slash connector. I just wanted to understand better what's your planning towards, like, a, like you know, Redis API. It's not really an API, but sort of like compatibility going forward. And when you think is the time when we should fork the plugin to have, and that's also for other systems to have a Valky plugin versus when we must like you know like when like i mean obviously with the first breaking changes that are mandatory or so but like it's, do you have any plan that yet or is that sort of too far in the future so for valky we don't plan on making any breaking changes i the best recommendation i can give is don't take dependencies on new features that are on like new redis versions if you do want to 
stay away from Res long term, like probably just change as soon as like you need a feature in Valky. Like that's some feedback I've been giving to people. Like don't, if you're on Redis 5 and it's working fine for you, then you know, there's no need to upgrade. It's that's still open source. It's out of uh, support. Um, I believe currently open source only supports Redis 6. So the other good time would probably be if you're concerned about security and are worried about Redis falling out of the support cycle. That would be the other time to move to Valky. And then I would recommend going to Valky 7.2 and then moving from there. Okay, cool, thank you. And I think we had questions over here as well. All right, thank you. So I have a question about the feature. So uh, since my pr uh, last year's project, I have, we have we use the uh, KV system, but our company's internal KV system. But at that time, we found our project have two requirements. One is we need a strong consistency. So the we need the KV need to guarantee the strong consistency. But we found Redis don't have this feature. Another one is uh, because our data is have a huge volume, like uh, ten billions per table. So, but Redis have a limitation, a key value number limitation for each table. So I, I don't know whether uh, Walky have this uh, strong cons consistency feature, and they do have the limitation for the key value number for each table. So for the strong consistency concerns, Valky has the same constraints that Redis does. So, sure, today. just today. Um, we have talked about adding stronger consistency. I don't know how close that is to being on the roadmap. I think that's kind of a big change for how Valky would work. For the number of rows size, technically you can support 10 billion rows in Valky. There's no strong upper bounds. There is a technically a bound. It's two to the 48th, which it's a big number. It's much bigger than 10 billion. Um, and the key space would be like I, I would if you could use hashes and like shard that up, the key space would be much more efficient. If you have like billions and billions of keys, I would worry a little bit about the key space, right? Yeah, my, my guess also more intuitively is with that amount of data, you're probably looking to spill more of it to disk than what Valky does today, which keeps everything in memory, like Kyle was talking about. Yeah. We have talked about uh, tiering some colder data in an anti-cache like structure. So you have like the hot data in memory and then you tier cold data off, which solves one of the problems that Kai was mentioning were, so writes always stay in memory and then they get tiered off. But that's not something that's super actively being worked on. Sorry, not sure if you guys can hear me now. So I just want to quickly call out, uh, first of all, my name is Ping, I'm part of the uh, TSE. Um, so if you guys have ideas like data tiering, and also the uh, uh, strong uh, consistency requirements. I think we're open, uh, like Manly has already mentioned many times, we're open to all the feedback, the comments there. So feel free to go to the website, uh, GitHub, and then uh, file issues there, and then we can have the conversation, discussion in the open, in public. So basically, we are here for the community. Uh, we want to build yeah, something yeah. that really uh, valuable for the community. Yeah, so GitHub, Valky, IO, slash Valky. Um, I think we'd love to see an issue on that. It would be valuable for everybody to start looking at it from there. So coming out of a large fork like this, what would be the biggest challenges and like the biggest lessons learned from this whole situation? Like things that uh, other teams may need to know going forward or like lessons learned? That's a good question. I'm trying to think. That's actually hard. <laughs> I'll say one. Docs are harder to uh, localize than you will ever imagine. Um, so be careful with that. That's, that was a devil that surprised us a little bit. I started looking at it and went, ooh, this is going to be easy. And then I went, ooh, it's going to be hard. And then the TSC started looking at it and realized so many changes. So many changes. Because we saw there was another fork that just did a fine replace. And we're like, oh, we can probably just do that too. And then when we actually looked at their docs, they were kind of incomprehensible because it's, of that. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it's horrifying. You're like, what's Valky 2.4? You know, like that doesn't make any sense, right? And also what was even worse, just a lot of the docs were just out of date. Like yeah. they didn't even make sense anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I think was a great lesson learned for us is we actually had a very strong development community before the fork. 
I, I don't think it was mentioned here, but only about 20% of all the contributions to the project were from Redis pre-fork. So we actually had a very vibrant community from a lot of different people. And a lot of people were very interested in moving over to our new project after the license change because they, they were really looking to just contribute to open source. So having that community that was pretty decoupled from like the main vendor was really helpful for us. Because um, like the main Slack channel that we're all talking on, I owned it, not Redis. So I just renamed it from Redis open source to Valky open source, which is great. <laughs> Ping or when do you have any other things to add or Dimitri? Dimitri left. Okay, to go work. Any questions? Looks like we're trying to get the mic to anybody with your question up front. Beyond the contributor community, uh, what response have you seen from users and potential users? So I think most people are pretty ex excited about the fork, at least. A lot of users want to be using open source software. There is definitely a big contingent who's just like, you know, it's free before, it's free again. But I think a lot of people understand that having a reliance on one vendor is a pretty big risk to their supply chain if they depend on it. Like if they need help, they have to go to that one company. So having a community that they can go to is really exciting. Um, and I see a lot of people are also just like, you know, if AWS does it, if Google does it, if Oracle does it, I think a lot of people are really excited that like there's so many big companies who are like putting their weight behind it. And I think people are pretty excited about that. They're like, hey, this is probably where we should go because there's all these big companies going behind it too. We're at time. It's a miracle. Yeah. Uh, we'll stick around up here if you have questions. You probably want to talk more to Madeline than to me, but I'll answer questions too. You can say that, but I have to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got an interview to get to. Oh, right. Okay. So we'll stay up. I'll stay up here and channel Madeline as best I can. And maybe the TSC can stay if they have some opportunity to do so. I think Ping's coming with me. Ping's coming with you. Okay, maybe. When? Exactly. <laughs>